Yeah, Bootstrap, like when you use a grid system, you can ensure that um, all of kind of the normal dimensions of how things should be placed on a page will be uh, will be like honored and things will be lined up nicely. It also makes it really easy with a grid system to set what are called mo mobile breakpoints that make it so when like the browser gets smaller, the page can respond to that automatically without you writing a bunch more code. Um, so definitely anyone that's interested in CSS or interested in that side of things, like the, the front end side of things, make sure you check out um, something like Bootstrap or Primer or um, any of the other ones that are like that that exist. Um, Munir says, can you please show how to delete, rename, and change the attribute of a column in Rails, please? Uh, sure, I can show that. Um, so the general idea is that you would create a new migration um, rather than the existing migration. And I'll just run through that really quickly while we are, wait for people to come in. So I get my chat back. Uh, so imagine we were in that old app, the 12 app. And if I open the 12 app and I go to my uh, DB, remember it's the, we haven't created any migrations yet. So imagine I created here uh, Rails G model user. And we'll wait for the model to get created. And I can open up this migration. And maybe here I say uh, the user should have a name. And then I want to do Rails DB migrate. Okay, so now if I run that, you'll see that now there's a file called schema.rb that shows the shape of the user's table. So right now the user's table has just the name field. So a lot of people I think have been running into this. I'm just showing it because I consistently am getting this question from people. If you want to be able to change something about users, what you can't do is go back to your migration and just modify it. And the reason that you can't do that is because migrations, remember, are the transition from one state to another state. They're not about, you're not describing the what the table should look like. What you're doing is you're describing essentially a change, which is why when you read it, it says something like create table users, right? Because this statement actually goes and creates uh, a table called users. So if you want to make another change, what you have to do is you have to generate another migration. So instead of Rails G model, you'll type Rails G migration and we'll say add email to users. And you see all that it creates here is another migration file. So if I open that up by default, it's going to be empty. And I can write add column users email string. Um, and you can look up this. You can look this up if you just type in like uh, Rails migrations guide. The first thing that's going to come up is this active record migrations Rails guide. This will go through all of the details of how you can write migrations and the things you can do inside of them. But the simplest thing you can do is like add column, takes the table name, the name of the column, and then the type of the column. And now look, if I run Rails uh, DB migrate again, it'll only run the second migration. And then if I open up that uh, DB schema file, you'll see now that my users table has name and email. So a migration is a way to modify the state of the database. And they have the, all these handy methods for doing it because without those methods like add column, you'd have to go run uh, a SQL statement, like an alter table type statement. So Munir, I hope that helps you and everyone else that asked that question too. Uh, Julian says, I put the styles in the corresponding component. Uh, I was canceling uh, canceling user agent styles by making the elements have margin and padding zero. However, I placed the margin and padding zero in home c home.scss, which comes later than comments.scss. This canceled out the body styles I had in comments.scss. Uh, I could get around this by assigning. Um, yeah, so you could set you could set class body and you could scope everything that way. But the more common way is that your reset style sheet should actually be included in in, um, in this application file. Um, if you want it to work a different way, what you can do is you can do something here like require reset. And that'll basically make it so that you can essentially require the reset ahead of everything else. So these, these get run in order. So first you could require the reset file, then you could require everything else, and then you could require if you, you see the default state of this is that require self gets called last. 
right? So it's the last thing that gets included, which is why you're seeing the behavior you are, is that um, anything that's in this application file will actually override in the opposite order that you might think it would. So I hope, I hope that helps. Um, if you want, so basically the upshot is that if you want to solve the problem you're describing, you can just write require reset here and then make a file called reset that has those, those base rules inside of it. Um, anonymous attendee says, is it normal to be one to two exercises behind? Uh, I think so. Yeah, I think that's pretty much my expectation is that uh, one to two ex exercises behind is totally normal. Um, so what I would do if I were you is just spend as much time as you can reviewing the past couple exercises. I think I've said before that like my goal is that like one exercise behind is pretty perfect. Like you, you, I want you to be learning new things and hopefully the course is paced in such a way that I'm kind of like always teaching you what the next thing will be. And even if you don't get it in that lesson that you can um, then go back and watch that lesson again. And I know a lot of people are doing that. They're maybe watching the sessions more than one time. Um, and that's totally fine. I even saw some people sharing hints for like how to move around quickly inside the videos with like just key shortcuts. So that can be helpful as well. I also know a lot of people are, and I'm just telling this from like looking at your, your repositories, a lot of people are, um, are, go are going through the lecture again afterward and, and trying to follow along like, like, you know, thing for thing with what I'm doing. So they're not only just going straight to the exercise and just watching and then trying, like hoping that they absorbed it all, but they're actually going through the lecture and doing the thing as I'm doing it. So pausing the video and making sure that they can do the exact thing that I'm doing. Um, I find that to be a helpful way to learn, but I don't know um, if it is for you. So if it is, give it a shot. Uh, Felipe says, I found it amazing what Jen from Glitch told us about uh, how ideas are rare to find. Is that really true? Is it hard for companies to find new ideas to make apps of? I thought it's more difficult to apply ideas than to have them. Uh, what do you think? Do you agree with Jen, uh, Ms. Schiffer? Um, yeah, I think I agree that, so you need, you need both. You need ideas and you need execution because either one without the other one is not going to make any sense. If you have ideas and you have no execution, then that's not really worth much. Like when you hear people say, um, I have an idea for an app, but I can't tell you it. Uh, I always kind of like, I laugh a little bit at that because it's like, um, if you think that your idea is so revolutionary and so new that even someone hearing it is going to make it, um, make them go do it, then I think a lot of times people are overestimating the value of their idea, right? The, the idea really only makes sense when you pair it with the execution. But then on the other hand, execution by itself doesn't make a ton of sense either because there, as, as I'm sure you know, are plenty of apps that don't seem to make any sense or maybe aren't solving a real problem. So really the, the sweet spot, the perfect place you want to be is somewhere where you have an idea that's valuable and you're able to make it. So I don't know if that's like a non-answer answer, but I tried my best. Rajesh says, I generated two controllers, users and comments. I can see two SCSS files, users and comments.scss. Yep, that sounds right. Um, I added in my users file the following code and an A page to find for the users controller has a black background like it should with that S with the SCSS that you showed. Uh, you're rendering the page and that page also has a black background. Yes, so it's important to note, I think I, I noted this on the last one as well, is that all of these SCSS files get run on every page. They're, they're not, despite their name, they're not actually scoped to only certain controllers, they all get run. And the reason they all get run is because if you look in this application.css file, you'll see require tree dot, which basically means require every SCSS file in this directory. So they all get run. They all get run on every page. Obviously you can change that, but that's the default. And the only reason that there are multiple files is because normally you'll want to isolate kind of logic about a certain thing into a certain folder. So maybe on here, which is the home.scss, I wanna have like a homepage marketing header. You know, and then inside of the users one, I might want to have things related to like the login page or something like that. So I hope that helps. And anonymous attendee says, what's the reason for suddenly getting an action controller invalid authenticity token error? So that is related to a feature of modern web frameworks called CSERF, 
It's spelled CSRF. So if you're interested in reading more about why you're seeing the error, uh, you can go look at that. The most common reason that I can tell you that it might happen is like your server hasn't been restarted in a while and maybe your code space has like gone to sleep and come back. I would check that. Um, and then I think a lot of other people were getting caught up on the form for, and the important thing to check there, if I just open up a view, I can kind of show you. Uh, I know a lot of people are writing uh, form for user UF, something like this. This is not going to work with CSERF correctly. So if you're writing that, just change it. Change it to this, form for user.new. Okay, so instead of user as a symbol, you want the user object. Uh, Erica says, so reset would fix that too. Um, no, reset wouldn't fix that because remember, they all get run every time. So like uh, if we go into the views layouts folder, for example, in the application layout, which is the one that we saw is on every page, you can see here it says style sheet link tag application. So what happens, what Rails does is it takes all of the style sheets that you've written in all these various files and it puts them essentially together in the right order and it puts them inside of one style sheet that gets delivered to the browser. So even with the reset, um, you won't be able to isolate pages. So every page is going to get the same set of styles. If you want to be able to isolate something to only one part of your site, then you got to put a class on it. Or you can change this. You can, you can modify this. But for the most part, uh, you should not do that because the more style sheets that you separately send down to the user, the slower the page will be. Uh, Sewell says, I hope you had a great weekend. I did have a pretty good weekend. Um, I'm trying to build a hot tub out of wood right now, just out of like, just straight wood, um, trying to make a hot tub. And I've been having some trouble making the hot tub. So what I did is I built a baby hot tub um, to try out all the techniques. So I built like a, a one foot by six foot or six inch tall uh, baby hot tub and it doesn't leak and it's super cute. And now every time that someone comes over and they wanna go in the real hot tub, I'm gonna show them the baby hot tub. Uh, yeah, the waterproofing is tricky because you don't use any, uh, there's no waterproofing or glue or chemicals at all. It's only held together by the pressure of itself. Um, so it says, thank you for everything. I am interested in becoming very good at building apps and using Ruby on Rails. Great to have you, that, that's awesome. I'm curious if you can have advice on things to learn outside of the class to become job ready. Yeah, what I would do is I would, first off, I would go like, think of an idea that you wanna do. And we're gonna do this a little bit with the final project. So think of something, it doesn't have to be like a revolutionary business or something completely new. It just has to be like something that you think is fairly achievable. Something where you can kind of imagine how it might come together and then just start building it. Um, start like putting it out there, uh, go, uh, put it on Heroku, which is like an easy way to host a Rails app so that other people can see it. Start sending it to friends and see what they think of it. Um, you know, like it doesn't have to, um, I think a lot of people don't start something because they think like, oh, someone's not going to find this valuable. But when you're learning, you don't need people to find it valuable. You just need to make something. You just need to physically push yourself um, outside your comfort zone so that you actually go start doing something new. So that's, that's a, that would be my advice. Um, will we have a project at the end of this boot camp? This is a question from Manon. The boot camp ends this week. Uh, yes, there will be a project at the end, and that project uh, is a project that will be larger in scope. You'll have more time to do, and I will be uh, specifically looking at how you implement it. So I know I've been looking at all your homework the entire time. Hopefully, you're you're hearing my feedback. If you're if you're current with the homework, I've been giving feedback. It's hard for me to give feedback on old examples because. Um, I often can't see that you've done them. So if, you, if you've done an old session homework and you want feedback from me, please just message me on Slack and I'll give you the feedback that you want. Um, but if you are caught up to date on the new stuff that we're doing, um, this will be a little bit bigger project than that. And I'll be describing that at the end of the week. Uh, Joe says, are we going to learn how to place the site on a server that's running 24 seven? Uh, I'm not going to show it, or maybe I will show it on Thursday if people are interested in seeing it. Maybe we should. Um, if you're interested in seeing it, we can cover it on Thursday at the end of the class. Uh, the easiest way, again, is with Heroku, uh, H-E-R-O-K-U. 
Uh, Felipe says, just read today in a book that the most important thing together with solving a problem is to make a team with three H's, hacker, hipster, and hustler. Uh, what if we form a team maybe in the final project? Uh, yeah, I think, I think that's a great idea. I think if um, I, the, it's not going to be a team final project, but I do encourage people to, to work together and find ways to work together. I also know that there's someone in here or possibly multiple people in, in our, our community that are uh, trying to get people together to start like a project after the class. So I would just like ask around slash look around in the chats because I know that's a thing. Uh, Manon says at GitHub CTO Jason Warner is formerly Heroku. Uh, that is correct. He is. And how much time are we going? All right, he's the CTO. I don't know. If, I think I maybe that said CEO. He's the CTO. Uh, anonymous attendee says how much time are we going to put to complete the final project? Um, I don't want to go into too much detail now, but it's likely going to be a couple of weeks that you'll have uh, to finish the final project. And I think I mentioned this on a previous one as well, and uh, that. Um, that the final project is unlike the homework where most of the homework has been stuff that I've covered in the class, the final project is not necessarily going to be like that. So you're, you're not just going to be able to go back to the previous lecture and it's not, it's not just going to be another homework. Um, you're going to have to do some research in order to, to get the final project done. Phew. Okay. Uh, yeah, so hopefully I answered all the questions and now it is time to spend some time going through the homework. Okay, so I've created a new application just because I think it's a little easier because I was getting a little confused with what we were doing previously. Uh, I think I created, that well, looks, looks pretty empty. Okay, so we have two sets of homework to do. Um, let me open up the instructions for session 11. Um, and we'll start there and then we'll get to session 12 and then we'll teach a bunch of new stuff. Okay. So the first part is to create a user model and users have a name. So we know how to do that, right? Let's go to the right folder, 18, and let's do Rails G model user. That's going to generate a migration file. And we're saying that users have a name. So in here, we'll just put a name. Um, so I'll do that and I'll run Rails DB migrate. Okay. I'll remember that. Uh, next, I want to create a comment model. Comments have a body and they have a user ID corresponding to the user who made the comment. And it says as an added note that comments belong to users. So we can do that, Rails G model comment. I'm gonna open up that migration and I'm gonna add a string, which is the body. And I add an integer, which is the user ID. Um, I removed the timestamps here just because I, I don't wanna confuse things. Maybe we'll talk about those later, um, but they're not super important. So I just remove them for now. Okay, so now I've got two models and it says that it's a belongs to relationship. So remember what that means is that I go into the comment model and I'm gonna write belongs to user. And then I'm gonna go into the user model and I'm gonna write has many comments. Okay, does everything make sense for session one? Uh, we can prove that everything's lined up here by opening up a Rails console. We can do rails.create user and we can say name is John and let's say user equals, uh, sorry, user equals user.first. Okay, and then we can do user.comments.create uh, body hello. And if we do user.comments.count, we can see that now there's one comment. So everything's working, which is great. Exercise two, we wanna implement a page that lists all of the comments that have been made along with the user who made the comment. So for that, what I'm gonna do, is I'm gonna create a comments controller. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just create an index route. Because remember index is typically the route that shows all of the comments, or sorry, shows all of the whatever thing you're talking about. So I'm gonna Rails G controller comments. 
And then the first thing I need to do is wire this up so that we can actually see it in the browser. So I'm going to go into my comments controller and I'm going to implement def index. And remember what I like to do here is I like to say something like render plane. Okay. Just to make sure that it's, that it's working. So start with like the smallest thing that we can test and then build up from there. If I'm going to implement a comments controller index action, I need an entry in my routes to point at that. So I'm going to go into my routes. I'm going to delete that comment uh, and I'm going to write resources comments. And remember the reason I'm writing resources comments is because the resources comes with index show, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and what the index part of that looks like is get slash comments controller comments action index. And that's exactly the thing that I wanted to write. So instead, I'm just going to write resources comments because it gives me the thing that I want automatically. So now if I go into my browser and I go to uh, slash comments, it's going to try to, oh, I have to start my server. Open in browser. Uh, some people ran into this. If you run into this, then that means that you're now on a different code space. So you just have to copy this line and add it to your config application. So I'm going to just drop this right in here. And then when I refresh, oh, I need to restart my server. So anyway, I, a couple of people messaged me and ran into this. But OK, so now I'm on Rails. And now if I go to uh, slash comments, It says, okay, so that means it's working. The next thing I wanna do is I want to put together, instead of rendering plane, I want to put a, a real view together. So I'm gonna get rid of the render plane and then I have to go into my, remember views directory. So I'm gonna find the views directory, go into the comments folder and create a new file called index.html.erb. It's index because that's the name of the action and then .html.erb because that's what we write after. If I write hello world in here and I go refresh, we're gonna see that now I've got my controller, my route and my view and they're all, they're all gonna work together, okay? So now the task was to list all of the comments uh, and the users, what was it? List all of the comments along with the user who made the comment. Okay, so I'm going to uh, first want to send the comments from my controller. So I'll create an instance variable called the comments, which just has comment.all. So it's just going to show all the comments. Uh, we'll get this thing out of here. Okay, so we want to show all the comments. We put an instance variable to get them into the view. And now we just go into the view and we'll say, uh, h2, all comments, remember that's going to be a header, and then we'll do at comments, because remember we have at comments, which is the thing we just passed from the controller, comments.each do comment, and then here to keep things a little separate, we'll create a div, and then inside the div, we'll want to say comment.body, and then uh, maybe I'll put a break tag and then I'll write by comment.user.name. So remember the same way that I can do user.comments because I have a belongs to, I can do comment.user as well. So if I refresh this, we'll see hello by John. Pretty cool. Exercise three is where we're going to want to create a form where someone can type in their name. And then when they submit the form, they, we want to create a user object with that name and then store the ID of that user object on the session. And then we want to create a method on applicant application controller, which allows retrieving the current user. 
Um, anonymous study says, is it mandatory to go to slash comments? Uh, can we just implement it on the base URL? Yeah, you can implement it on the base URL. Um, that would also be fine. I just chose to, to do it here to illustrate the resources. Okay, so we're gonna create a form on here. Uh, when I create my form, I'm going to, uh, so when you read create form, it, that should indicate to you that you're gonna use something like a form for tag. So I'm gonna use form for, it has to be for something. In this case, I'm gonna say that it's for the new user. A new user in a form is going to get a text field, which takes in their name and then a submit button. And then we can call this area, we can say login. Okay, so if I refresh, we're gonna see that there's a problem. And the problem is that there is no method called user's path. And what that's actually trying to say is not that there's no method called user's path, but that we haven't defined a controller that will actually receive the request. And we haven't defined a resources line in our routes that would create a method called user's path, which remember is the method you get for the index or post actions when creating, sorry, index or create actions when creating a new user. So let's get that, get that wired up and hopefully the error is gonna go away. I'm gonna close my server. I'm gonna do Rails G controller users to create a users controller. And then I will go over to my routes file, which is gonna be in config. So we'll go to config slash routes. And in here, we're gonna create resources users. And we're hoping to access, remember that automatically created, we have index show, there's automatically created create endpoint. That's the one that we're hoping to get out of here. So if I refresh, uh, we'll see a 503 because I didn't restart the server. So let's try it out again. Go to comments, I'm gonna type my name in here. Oh, see, now the form renders. And when I hit enter, look what it says. It says the action create could not be found for users controller. And of course that makes perfect sense because we never implemented it. So let's go back to our controllers, go to the users controller and we'll make a create method in here. So the first thing is we need to get the name. The name will be params of user of, of name. And then we need to create a user with that name. So when we create a user, it looks like this. Now we need to put that into a variable. I'm gonna call my variable user or let me say newly created user. And then we're gonna put the ID into the session. So we'll say session of user ID equals newly created user dot ID. So we have the newly created user object and we just take the ID off of it and put that into the session. Now we can't end with nothing. We need to do something at the end of this. We either need to show something to the user or though mo more commonly in these create actions and update actions, we just redirect somewhere else. So what we're going to redirect, in this case, I'm just going to redirect the comments. So I'm going to just send them right back to the comments page. Um, if you had a, if, if you wanted and you're using the base URL, you could just write redirect to root. Um, but again, I've implemented it as comments, so let's do it. Okay. Oh no, invalid authenticity token. Okay, we're gonna get to see how to work through this right here. It's gonna be great. So if you get this, I'm gonna to try to explain what happens, but I'm not gonna to go too deep into why this happened. The reason um, that it happened is because the first time that I submitted the form, I was sending the uh, original authenticity token. Um, and again, if you want more detail, detail about this, read about CSRF in RELS. Um, and then remember we hit the error page and then I refreshed again. So I'm trying to resubmit the form. Uh, that form re resubmission is part of what's trying to be protected by the CSRF protection. So an average user is never gonna hit this because they're never going to hit an error and then try to refresh the form again. So let's see what happens if we just go to slash comments we go to this page, 
we type in John and we create user. Oh no, same problem. Okay, now we got to figure out what's going on here. So I'm guessing that people ran into this. I saw some people uh, get around it by, um, ah, I see the problem. Okay, so this is a, uh, this is a code spaces specific problem, it looks like. I'm actually surprised that we didn't run into this earlier. Um, I'm surprised this wasn't a problem with all of our other forms before. Yeah. It might be that the, the code space changed URLs. I'm, I, I don't know. I'm just surprised that this wasn't a problem because what it's saying is that the origin header localhost doesn't match the base URL, which is this. And of course that's true. Um, so in order to work through it here, uh, I'm going to um, do what people are saying here. Is it, is it just like this, protect from forgery? Is that how people, let's take a look. Okay, so we'll just do that for now. Um, I will follow up uh, with more detail on that. But you can see now when I've done that, I've added uh, protect from forgery inside of application controller. But now things are, are working as they should. Um, this is an odd thing that I'm gonna have to look into more because um, I think that while it's understandable that it shouldn't work in code spaces, that it's not ideal. Ideally, you should just be able to start the server and it should work. So. I'll have, to, uh, I'll have to read more about that and figure out what's going on. Okay, so when you type in a username, uh, we are now creating a user behind the scenes and then we're putting a session user ID key with the ID of the newly created user. But we're not actually outputting anything about that current user on this page. Yeah, it is, it is weird. And a lot of people are commenting in here, uh, trying to help me out with that, and I appreciate it. Yeah, the error dialog always is read like that. I don't, I don't know if it's customizable. Um, so if if you're having that problem and it's not going away, just um, for now, just do the protect from forgery line that I wrote. Okay, so we're putting it into the session, but we are not showing it anywhere. So ideally, what I want to be able to do is output it onto the page. Um, the way that I want to do that is maybe have an area up at the top here where I say something like uh, user and I'll create a new section on the page. And I want to be able to say uh, logged in as uh, current user, right? Current user dot name. So if I refresh now, you'll see that um, it says undefined local variable or method current user. And that's because we haven't actually created the current user method. Uh, we will go create that now on our application controller. So we want to create current user. Um, and in current user, we want to basically have uh, at, sorry, return user dot find by ID session user ID. So this is taking the user ID from the session. We could even put it into a local variable if we wanted to called um, session user ID or something. And then find the user that corresponds to that and return it because this is like an implicit return, right? So we're gonna return the user that matches that session. So if I refresh here, it's still gonna say undefined variable and method current user. And the reason for that is that while we've defined current user and application controller, we haven't made it a helper method. So we'll go into here and we'll write helper method current user. If I save that and I go back, uh, now it's saying something different. It's saying undefined method name for nil class. So if you look at the code that it's calling out, it's saying that it can't find the method name for nil class, which it thinks that current user is nil. So I'm not quite sure why that's happening, but I am sure that we need to be able to handle that case where current user is nil. So remember, people can be logged out or they can be logged in. So we'll make a minor modification to our code here. We'll say if 
current user else. So if there is a current user, then we want to write you're logged in as current user. And then in the else, we'll say uh, you're logged out. So let's refresh the page again. And I'll look what it says. It says logged out. So let's type our name in here. Hit enter. OK, so there's some kind of bug going on. We're creating the user, and it's not actually, uh, it's not actually setting the session correctly. So let's investigate. Looks like here we're checking user underscore ID from the session to get the user ID. And when you create a user, we are setting session of user ID to the newly created user. Hmm. Okay, does anyone have an idea what's going on here? Yeah, so here, uh, so someone says dot and underscore, someone says implicit return. Yeah, so this is an implicit return uh, inside of the user's controller. It looks like dot and underscore is all working okay. We're, we're setting this correctly. In order to investigate, let's go in here and let's do a puts obsession.inspect. And let's refresh the page. And let's take a look in here. Hopefully, we will see. Uh, the output that we just did a puts with. Okay, I'm, I'm not at the bottom. Okay, so here we go. Here's the session. Uh, and if I look in here, I can't really kind of see what's happening. So let's uh, let's change it to puts session of user ID dot inspect. Uh, let's try again. What I'm trying to do is get the output of what's happening inside of there uh, so that we can see. OK, you can see here that it's nil. So the data for the session is actually not uh, filled in. So our session of user ID is nil. Um, I'm guessing it has, were, were people able to make this protect from forgery work, um, work correctly with this? Because I'm, OK. Okay, so then in here, we're creating username, we're creating a user. So let's here, the next thing I would want to check is we will do a puts uh, newly created user dot ID dot inspect. So we want to make sure that we're actually putting something in to the session. So let's do this and let's go create another user. Okay, and let's go look at our output here. And you can see there, you see the five? I saw it. Uh, we can see a five right here. So it actually is putting the thing into the session correctly. Um, so I'm thinking what's happening is something with the this uh, forgery protection is kind of messing with, with our codes. So we have to figure that out real quick. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, um, I'm going to remove this for now. And I'm going to let the thing happen again. And then we're going to go into here. This is good uh, debugging practice for everyone. Uh, we're going to go into here, and it's going to say uh, invalid authenticity token. Um, OK. And it's saying that the problem is this. So I'm going to search that. I'm just going to copy the exact thing uh, that I that I pulled and people maybe did this process too. Um, so in order to really fix it on code spaces, we would have to set up some kind of like a, uh, a proxy or something like this. Um, the thing that was just written in the chat, I think is what I'm going to end up doing. Um, I think that this is even better though. So uh, the thing that was suggested in the chat is to, um, to turn off the authenticity checking, which we can definitely do. But another way to solve it is to do what this person is suggesting on the internet, which is to copy 
this in here. And what this is saying is only turn off the origin check part of the forgery protection. Um, so we, we can talk, if people are interested in more details about this, we can talk about it, but I'm not gonna go too deep into it because it's very specific to, uh, to code spaces. So I'm gonna go here, I'm gonna restart the server. I'm going to go to comments and I'm going to say I'm John. Okay, and now it's working as we expect. Okay, so something about the forger protection was stopping us from holding onto the session between requests. Uh, but you can see now that I'm logged in as John. And if you didn't have any of these problems, just completely ignore this section. You're never gonna face this in a real Rails application. And if you do, you can just Google like I did. Um, so you can find an answer and you can apply it just like we did there. Okay. Let's keep going. Uh, so we have now created a current user method and we're using it. Uh, we're using it inside of, uh, inside of application controller. I should give them a thumbs up. Oop. Okay. So now we're on to section or exercise four, which is that we wanna implement a form which takes in the body of a comment and puts it in the database along with the ID of the current user. We can do that, we have all the pieces. So what we have to do is we have to go to the comments page uh, is here. And in between the login form and there, I'm gonna create a new comment form. So we'll just write H2 uh, new comment H2. And we will do form for comment.new to F. And and remember, what does a comment take in? It takes in a body and it's gonna take in the submit button or we're gonna use the submit button. And it is gonna take in the user ID, but we wanna pull that off of the session. So hopefully I can type in here, hit create comment. Oh no, the action create could not be found for comments controller. Of course, because we haven't created it yet. So let's go to the comments controller. Let's implement create. Okay, now what do we want in order to create a comment? Just kind of sketch out what's happening. We want to create a comment. We want to be able to pass it a body and we want to be able to pass it a uh, user ID called, we'll call it created by user ID. That's what we ideally, oh, and we want to call create. So this is ideally what we want to do. We want to be able to create a comment and we want to pass these two things. This is often how I stub out code. So I, I want to figure out how to get body and I want to figure out how to get created by user ID. And then after the create happens, I want to redirect to comments. Okay. So this is kind of the outline. And now all I have to do to make it work is I have to figure out how to get these two things. So body is pretty easy because it's just params of comment of body. Created by user ID is current user dot ID. Because remember, I already have current user. Um, for here, I would also accept something like session of user ID, although I prefer the, the first version. So current user dot ID. Now we can refresh, run it, and look, quarter by John. Can't believe it's only been 12 days. So that's exercise 11. Okay, I'm gonna spend some time reading through some comments. I've got a couple of things related to the verify authenticity token. I appreciate everyone who's trying to help. Uh, anonymous attendee says, sir, I have a question. If you could help me after class, please. I'm happy to help you. Just find me on Slack and I'll, I'll do my best to do everything I can to help you. Uh, Felipe says, how do you estimate if the Google result after searching is good or not? Uh, Google is really good. I mean, like you, you, if you copy something that's fairly common and you put it into the browser, pretty much the first result is, is helpful to me every time. Um, now what's important is like, imagine if you didn't add a code and you just like Googled how to code, that's not going to give you good results. 
that's why the boot camp is really important is like teaching you the language of what we're talking about so that you can describe the problem you're having so that Google can get you a good result. You know, like a, even as a professional programmer, I spend a lot of time Googling things. So the boot camp's going to get you to a point where you know how to ask the question and then it's on you to, to find the answer. But Google is very helpful um, on finding the answer. Um, yeah, also you mentioned, uh, is it good to only look at curated sources like Stack Overflow, GitHub, et cetera? Um, yeah, I mean, I tend to have pretty good luck with just going with whatever Google sends back first, uh, discounting the sponsored results. Anonymous attendee says, what happens if we set session user ID instead of session user ID? They spelled session user ID wrong in one. Uh, you just if you just use the same same name everywhere, then it should be fine. So use if you misspell it once and you misspell it in a second place, that's totally fine. Um, so yeah. Anonymous attendee says, somehow I did the steps backwards. I started with users. So I have all the users listed with their comments via link. That's okay. That's fine. Uh, anonymous attendee says, could you please explain in which cases you have to use nested resources? So it's any time that you want to be able to create a, a, a property that is a sub property of something else. So for example, you... Um, have a website where there are multiple bars and every bar has uh, multiple menus. Maybe they have a dinner menu and they have a, a drinks menu. And then every uh, menu has multiple items inside of it. That's a good case for nested resources because you want your URL, the thing up in the top of the browser to say something like slash name of the bar, slash name of the menu, and then slash items or something. Um, so nested resources are really useful when you want to create that hierarchy of items on your page. Um, so I hope that helps. And I think I also explained it a bit more in the lesson where we introduced nested resources. Uh, Felipe says, sorry if this was already answered. Can you please explain a little bit about the error messages in Ruby? What means each part of the messages in red and black? Uh, sure. So in order to explain that, I'm going to purposely raise an error that we can take a look at. So the first part is the top here, which tells you the name of the error and in what controller action or model it happened in. This is the actual text of the error. So in this case, my error said hi. So we just see hi here. This is called a stack or a backtrace. I'm oh, sorry, not a backtrace. This is called a, um, like it's a snippet around the line where the error happens. So you can see here is the error that I have. It tells me around what line it happened in. It highlights that line. And then it shows me a couple of lines on either side of where the actual error came from. So that can give you an idea of what part of your code is having the error. And then down here, we have a, a backtrace, which is a list of um, when the error happened, which part of the code it was in. So you can see here that the error came from commentscontroller.rb on line five inside of the index method. And then they give you some helpful things down here, which is basically, uh, you can look here and you can see what were the parameters that were sent in this request where the error happened. In this case, there are none because remember there are no, uh, it's just slash comments. There is no like ID or anything, but that would show up here. I can even see my session dump. So I can see in here, I can see what the current user ID is set to, the session ID. Um, I can even dump the env and see all of the settings that are currently set for my server. And then I can see what the current response, it's just a bunch of details about your request so that if you're having trouble tracking down why an error is happening or where it's happening from, it's gonna give you some detail. And I would say, I actually had it on my list uh, of things today to talk about that like learning how to read the errors and how to give yourself an idea of what's happening is an acquired skill. You're gonna get that over time. So like, um, a lot, of, a lot of times people will send an error, for example, and I, I've had a couple of these where it says like um, the host thing, for example, that we ran into earlier, it says something in the error, like add this line to your application configuration. And it says it right in the error, but it sometimes because there's so much going on on this page, 
and it seems so daunting to read it, even though the little red text here is telling you exactly what to do, like add this particular line to this file, um, it still uh, is daunting and it's hard to focus on that part because you don't know where to focus. So the more errors you see and the more time that goes on, the more your eyes will just jump to the place. The first thing you should be reading really is this, is this line here, which will show you what exact error is happening. So for example, uh, if I do something more real, instead of comment that all, I'll make a typographical error. I'll just be comment that LL. If I refresh again, what it's saying is undefined method LL for comment, right? And then it even shows me where it happens. So it says, hey, on this line, you tried to call a method on comment called LL, but that method is undefined. So hopefully by looking at this and reading it in consideration of what line the error happened on, you can kind of figure out what happened. So in this case, it hopefully when reading this and this, it's pretty obvious what's going on. It's trying to call a method LL, but that method is undefined. And it's of course, it's because I, I made a typographical error. It should be all. So you refresh and it's fixed. Anonymous attendee says, could we have used rest in this example and make this work? Uh, I think you could have. So the, the question is, could we have used nested resources to do this example? I think you could have, but it would be a little bit weird. And I'll try to explain why. Um, in the example that I said previously, where there's there are multiple bars in your app that have multiple menus inside of them, that's something where all users all users will have to know um, about all of the bars. Now, this app is a little bit different because they're not nested resources. You can only be logged in as one user at a time. So it's kind of not the same thing. Um, if this was an app where maybe you wanted to be able to create, uh, instead of a user, maybe a person object and then put comments about that person, that would be a case for nested resources. Um, I hope that explanation makes some sense. I realize it's a confusing differentiation, but basically the idea is that user or current user, things that are about the person who's currently logged in is, is different than the hierarchy of a website. Um, so some example of that is like, if I, if I had a site like Yelp that has multiple bars and has different menus inside of the bars, um, it would be weird for the URL to have any information at all about who the current user is. It's like user is kind of something different. User is uh, part of your state on a website less than it is part of the, the nesting of the resources. So I hope that helps whoever asked this question. Um, anonymous attendee says, so can this application leave comments by multiple users? Uh, yes, it can. So if I go in here and I go and log in as someone else, and I want to log in as Erica and click create user, it's going to go create a user. And now at the top, it says logged in as Erica. I go into the new comment and say, hello world, create comment. And now in my comments list, you'll see that the last comment is hello world by Erica. Anonymous attendee says, are there any other bits of state that are commonly stored in the session? Um, I would definitely say user ID is the most popular piece of state that's stored in the session. Uh, another one is um, a thing called flash data, which basically, uh, let's say that you, let's say you create a comment and then on the next page, you wanna be able to say, thanks for creating a comment. You normally can't do that because um, remember when I, when I click create a comment, uh, the create endpoint, all it does is create a record and then it redirects me back to the list of comments. So you might want to put something in the session that says, hey, this user just created a comment. And then on the next request, you'll, you're able to read that, show some state because now you know they just created a comment and then delete that comment you just created. So I hope that makes sense. Like any kind of short lived state like that is normally stored in the session. Um, I'm sure there are other things, there, there are many things that apps store in sessions, but for the most part, it's like identifying information about the user, like the user ID. So I hope that answers your question, anonymous attendee. Uh, Rajesh says, thank you for the nested resource answer that helped. One more question. 
how can we go back to a user already created in this example? Uh, you can't. You can't in this example, the way that it's going to work uh, for now in this example is that your login, if I type John again, it's actually creating a new, a new object every time. So if you wanted to do that, I can show you really quickly how that would work. So we have our uh, create users endpoint that currently always creates a new user. Now imagine if I just modify it slightly and I say um, found user equals user dot find by name is name. And then I can say if found user, then uh, session of user ID equals found user dot ID else session of user ID equals uh, newly created user. And then I just take the newly created user and put it up there and end. So now the way that the code reads is, hey, try to find the user. If you find the user, set their ID. And if you can't find the user, then create a new one and set their ID instead. Yeah, this is pretty cool. And actually, uh, just for those that are interested and don't feel bad if this doesn't make sense right away, but uh, you can actually do uh, find or create by uh, name, name. And this is the same thing. So this line uh, paired with something like that, these two lines are the same as all of this. So Rails actually gives you this find or create by method that does the same thing that I just wrote. It basically checks if the thing exists and then if it doesn't, it creates it and then it returns the, the user either way. Um, so I hope that answers the question of the person that was asking that. I can even prove to you that it is working by taking a minor modification to my view. So instead of just writing by comment.user.name, I'll write by comment.user.name and then in parenthesis, I'll write uh, comment.user.id. So this will give us the ability to independently identify the users. And you'll see the problem that they're trying to point out. See these two Johns? They're actually different uh, entries in the database. But now check this out, Erica is seven, right? And if I log in as, sorry, if I log in as John again and click create user, do, it's gonna take its time. Come on. Okay, I'm not sure what's going on. Uh, Okay, so now it says I'm logged in as John at the top. And if I type in a new comment and I say, hello world again, and I click create comment, you'll see that I'm logged in. Oh, wait, it says eight, uh-oh, let's try again. Logged in as John, create a comment. Okay, and see, see this time I'm logged in as John and it says by John one, which means that when I logged in again, it was able to find the first John record in the database and log me in as that person. So hopefully that answers your question. Uh, Ernest says, why was protect from forgery causing the session problem? However, config dot action controller dot whatever worked. I don't know offhand, but I'm guessing what happened is that protect from forgery was kind of hiding the issue and was making it so that the session was refreshing between every single request. I don't, I'd have to look into it for more details. The reason that the thing that I actually did worked is because it turned off the check that was actually preventing it from working. So there's, um, if you read more about CSRF protection, one part of it in Rails at least is that it's verifying that um, the request sent to the server uh, is from the same domain as the form was, that they were both to the same domain. So I just turned that piece off. Again, you don't have to know that if you're not interested in uh, Rails security. And if you work on a real app, you'll never see this problem. Um, the more I'm going through this, the more I'm thinking that we might actually on Thursday um, and for the final project would probably be useful to have you all uh, push an app to Heroku. So I'm gonna figure out how we can do that in a reasonable way. Um, okay, Rajesh says that wouldn't be okay because users can have the same name. Uh, 
I think you're talking about the thing I just did. Um, and yeah, uh, if I haven't answered your question, let me know. But the idea is um, that names are unique. So if you're logging in as the same user that already exists, then um, in this new implementation, uh, there's only one of each user. Rajesh says also find by uh, would only return the first record. So what if we want to create third John's message? Yeah, the idea, again, is this is a very simple app. It's not a real comments app. But the idea is that if you had multiple Johns, that you would need some kind of uniquely identifiable information, for example, the email. And you'd actually log in by that. So all the code we wrote so far, except instead of using name, instead of finding by name, you find by email. And then you can have a name, which is separate. So I hope that answers your question. Name would be the or email would be the thing you use to look up the account, which again has to be unique across the accounts. And the name would just be a property of the user object that is just for displaying, not for looking up. Uh, Rajesh, it is fine. Rajesh, I've, I've noticed a few times that um, that you are um, your questions are not about the. They're, they're not about like a technical difficulty. They're about wanting more detail about the thing to, to try to convince yourself of like why it's necessary, necessary or why we're doing this thing. That's a good sign. That's how engineers think. So please keep asking those questions when, when they're relevant because I think it is, uh, it is the type of question that will push boundaries and help other people learn. So thank you. Okay, cool. Exercise 12. Okay, we're gonna use CSS to make our messages and comments app a bit prettier. We're spending a lot of time just on the homework, but this is two, this is two homework. So um, I guess it, it's not too bad, but we do have a lot to cover today. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of rush through this, uh, this CSS exercise a little bit. So we're gonna make it a little bit more pretty. So in order to do that, we'll just go into app assets. We'll go into the style sheets directory. We already have a style sheet set up here. There's a comments one. That's where I'll put my code. Uh, we'll say that our divs should have uh, padding around them. And what that's going to do is going to space out these messages a little bit. So those look a lot better. Uh, it says that it wants us to be creative. Uh, we'll do, we'll make the background pink. And just because I know people asked about it before, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to make it so that each of the messages that are by the user who's currently logged in get a special color. So what we'll do is we'll make a class called active and we'll make the background of all of the active ones be green. So let's try to make that actually work. We will go back to our view to the index file. And now here when I'm doing this div, what I'll do is I'll do class equals. And inside of here, I'll say, actually maybe an even easier way to write it is I'll write if comment.userID equals current user ID, and I'll write it else. So what I'll do is in the, if it is the same user, I'll do class equals active. And if it's not the same user, we'll just do div. So let's give it a shot. Okay. So now you can see that all the comments that are by this user are green. Come on, it's pretty cool. <laughs> and we need to be able to have this page still work if the user is logged out. So this actually needs to be something like if current user and comment ID is the same as the user ID. Otherwise, what would happen is when we tried to call current user ID on a person who's logged out, it would error. Um, Erica says, how do you write justify the text? Yeah, so if I wanted to write justify the text of the things that was created by me to make it more like an iMessage type thing, uh, what I could do is I could just add text align write. We'll do that, refresh, and we got a real app. Okay. Uh, the next part is find and use a new CSS property that we didn't discover in the course. Uh, what I'm going to show you is I will show you uh, a border radius. So I'm going to do border radius five pixels. 
and I refresh again, and now all of them have rounded corners. Okay, that's exercise 12. Okay, so now we have a lot of new material to cover. So everyone get ready. Yeah, um, it is a simple app, but actually like close to being useful. It's, it's like kind of amazing, like how quick uh, something like that can be put together. And you can imagine, even if you're not making a chat app, like all the fundamentals are there where this could be anything. It could be a recipe site. You could have users put multiple recipes. You could have a recipe directory. You could have the individual recipes have individual pages. We have all of the we have all the foundation to do all that. You can do, uh, you can make a recipe site. You can extend the idea to anything. It doesn't have to be a chat app. You could make a, a catalog of all of your records, or you could make a catalog of um, all of the buildings in your town, or who, who knows? I mean, it's really up to you what you make. Okay, so we gotta get going. Today, we're gonna talk about JavaScript for the most part. Uh, this is gonna be our crash course introduction to JavaScript. Uh, we're going to try to get pretty far with JavaScript. And I realize that that is going to be a lot, uh, but I'm going to try to only focus on the parts that are super important. And the reason I'm going to do that is because Rails has a view of JavaScript uh, for the most part. So you can, you can use as much JavaScript as you want. Um, but by default, the idea in Rails is that your JavaScript can, can be pretty minimal um, because of some nice JavaScript helpers that are built into Rails by default. I don't know if anyone's noticed this, but sometimes when you click between multiple pages, a little blue bar shows to the top of the screen and it moves straight across. And that's because Rails, even by default, has a thing built into it called Turbo Links, which essentially turns your Rails app into a single page app-ish. So when you, um, when you click between pages, for the most part in Rails, what's happening is you're not actually clicking between the pages. What you're doing is you are, um, just taking the the uh, middle part of the page, the part inside of your layout, and swapping that part out. So that all happens completely transparently to you. Uh, Rails is essentially doing all of the work to make your page faster by making it so that you don't have to reload the entire page. Um, so if there's something in your layout, you'll notice that that thing doesn't change uh, unless you unless you particularly change something inside of it on every request. Um, but basically the point is that Rails has a lot of JavaScript goodness built into it. Um, but there are limitations to that. So in order to overcome those limitations, we are going to do a basic introduction to JavaScript. Okay, first I have to show you where JavaScript goes in a Rails application. So remember when we created a style sheet, we put it into the app assets style sheets directory. JavaScript goes into the app JavaScript directory. App JavaScript packs. And you'll notice inside of there, there's a file called application.js. Okay. And right at the top of application.js, there's a thing that says this file is automatically compiled by a web pack along with any other files present in this develop directory. Okay. So you're encouraged to place your actual application logic in a relevant structure within app JavaScript and only use the pack file to reference the code that is compiled. So that means we can go into our JavaScript directory and create a file. We'll call it hello.js. And we're gonna do our first piece of JavaScript by just writing alert hi. We don't even need the semicolon, so alert hi. So a little bit different than Ruby in that these, um, and we can use the double quotes too, so it's not confusing. These parentheses, are required in JavaScript. So in Ruby, this would be written as this. In JavaScript, that doesn't work. So just remember in Ruby, you don't need the parentheses. In Java, you do. Or, sorry, JavaScript, you do. Okay. Um, we are going to try to understand why this is not working. Um, a little confused why this isn't working. Let me just try one thing real quick. So 
Just give me one second, sorry. Hmm. Yeah, I think it, I think it isn't required, which is a little strange because this uh, this top uh, part here makes it sound like it would be. Um, so what we'll do for now, uh, for now, just so that um, we don't have uh, any problems. Do you want me to Google it, or do you want me to 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 just put it in this file? Google it. Okay, let's Google it. Rails new uh, JavaScript file won't load. Okay, first file, first one. Okay, so it says you probably missed including them in your manifest file. Um, so that I think is right on an. Let's try it. Let's try the second result and see. Uh, this one specifically says Rails six, so that I know is a more, more recent, uh, a more recent thing. So let's go in here, and it says packs slash my. That's what we did. We put it in. Oh, we did not put it inside of the packs directory. Um, but I don't think I want to put it in the packs directory. Hmm. So this is uh this is not great right now. Yeah. Okay, how do I search just in the past month? Um, maybe we'll just type 2021. And Okay, it's got some got some stuff here. Okay, look inside their pack, they are importing a style sheet, which is a little weird. Um, yeah, they have okay. They have to run this to auto reload. So let let me uh, let me exit my server and restart my server, and then refresh my page. I'm gonna move it back there. Okay, I think I'm I'm on the verge of just just sticking with what I had before, and we, we can pick it up on a different episode or a different uh, session. So for now, what we're gonna do, just so we can keep going, is we're gonna create the relevant code inside of uh, this application JS file. Um, I do know that that you can uh, you can require other files in here, and that's how I would normally do it. Um, so like you would put in application JS, you would put a require statement that references another file and you'd have to list them all. But based on this description, I would have thought that um, that this would happen automatically. So I'm a little confused and sad. So um, Yeah, I guess we can just we can just try to import it. So let's let's just do that. Uh, let's just import the file. Give me one second. So we'll just go into this file and we'll just do like a I don't know require. This is not going great. Stop it. <laughs> Um, require, and we'll do dot dot slash hello. And if I refresh that now, we can see that the alert hi is working. Um, I, I, yeah, so the it should work fine, but what I'm a little confused about is why uh, why I had to add that line because I shouldn't, I don't think I should have to. Because um, see if it says, oh, present in this, okay. Few, it's all figured out. It's only the packs that get automatically compiled. You still have to reference the files. So here's what I did. I did require dot dot slash hello, and that'll bring in the actual file that I'm talking about. And then I've created the hello file. The dot dot means go back to the previous directory. So I'm in the packs directory, but notice that my hello.js file is actually in the one back directory. 
So I've created hello.js in the one back directory. So in order to require it here, I need to do dot dot slash and then the file that I want to require it in. Okay. And then I've created this file and all I put inside of it is alert high. So then when I refresh the page, you'll see that it does alert high. So you probably guessed um, by everything that we just did that what the alert method does in JavaScript is it just opens a little box like this with the text, whatever you say inside of it. You click okay and it goes away. That's all that, that alert high does. But we need to learn some more pieces of JavaScript to do things that are more, uh, if you don't see the alert, it's probably that you're not requiring it correctly. So you need to uh, go into application.js, do something like require dot dot slash hello, and then go, oh, you didn't see the alert. It's okay, I'm never doing an alert again. Uh, the alert probably just didn't show up in the screen share. You gotta, you gotta it was there, <laughs> you gotta believe me. Um, okay. Man, I could have just told you the alert was working all along. Okay, so we're gonna create um, the ability to do something slightly different. And instead of the alert, I'm going to do console.log hello. Okay, so this console.log hello is going to give me the ability to, instead of the alert popping up, it's going to show up. You open the inspector and go to the console tab. And now if I refresh the page, you'll see over here, it says hello. So what we've done by doing this is we've given us the ability to write some code and then be able to see what it's doing. That's really the whole point to this whole thing. We can write some JavaScript code and we can see what it's doing. Um, and there are many other ways we could use a different website to write the JavaScript code and play with it. We could go into the terminal and we could use something called node to do the same thing. But this is the way that we want to do it because we're using a web app and this is the easiest way to get JavaScript not only running, but also inside of the page. Um, and that's an important point that I want to make real quick, which is that um, JavaScript, I think I introduced at the beginning of the course, doesn't run on the server. It runs actually in the browser. So what gets sent down to the browser for the user visiting the page is actually, it sends the JavaScript file down to the user's browser. And then the user's browser runs the code. So this is the only place where you're actually sending code to somewhere else and then it's just trusting you and it's running it. So the browser has all kinds of protections to make sure that um, the code that it's running inside of the browser can't like escape the browser and hack your computer. Um, but that is what's happening. You're sending code to the user and then their, their computer is running it. So if your JavaScript client side code is slow um, for the user, it's it'll be slow if their computer is slow. Um, does that make sense? It's, it's different than Ruby. It doesn't run on the server. It runs inside of the browser. Okay, so we're going to do a couple of things with JavaScript. First thing we're going to learn is we're going to learn about variables. So they're very similar to Ruby variables. They look like this. Let name equals John. And then what I can do here is I can do hello. And I can remove the hello and just replace it with name. And then my browser is going to cross it out. Or my, uh, my editor is going to cross it out. OK, what do we got? What do we got going on in the chat? I get this error on inspection. Uh, uncaught reference error request is not defined. Um, that seems like maybe you modified something inside of this. Oh, sorry, it's not request. It, it should be required. I think you just have a typographical error on, on where you're actually doing the require. But if not, let's figure it out. Um, OK, so I did a console.log name. And you can see that in my terminal over here, when I refresh, now it outputs my name. OK, so the JavaScript file is running whenever the, the browser opens. So that's basic variables. They work pretty much like Ruby. You can put a string like this, just like in Ruby. You can also put a number, just like in Ruby. They're, they're exactly the same. Um, there are minor details that you'll stumble upon, but for the most part, you can think of them as the same. The only difference is when you're declaring a variable, you should write let before it. Although realistically, even if you don't, it's still going to work. So 
you know, try try to remember to write let because that's how you write JavaScript. But you know, for the most part, the only difference is, is that let goes before declaring a variable, and instead of puts, it's console.log. Uh, let's talk about conditionals real quick. So a conditional in JavaScript is pretty similar uh, to um, to in Ruby. So this I'm going to rename. I'm going to rename this the name because I'm tired of looking at my editor doing this to me. Okay, yeah, JavaScript should look weird now because uh, we spent so much time inside of nice Ruby. Um, so, okay, ifs in JavaScript, they need these parentheses. Now you're gonna, re you're gonna remember why Ruby is so great. We're not gonna go too far into JavaScript. We're just gonna go far enough that you can make a little bit of uh, client-side behavior, which we're gonna need. So ifs have these parentheses around the statement. And then these curly braces, are the same thing as when we have like a do end in Ruby, these curly braces are the do and end. And then notice that the comparison here, instead of being two equal signs, is three equal signs. Okay. So if we run this, we're gonna see it output my name because of course, John equals John. If I change the first thing to Kate, and then I refresh the page again, uh, we're gonna see it not output anything because Kate is not equal to John. Uh, all the other conditionals work the same way. You can have an else statement like this. Um, although again, I'm not gonna go super into JavaScript. We're just gonna cover the basics, just enough to get to uh, interactions with the, the person that's using the page. I'm gonna show you a couple more things. I'm gonna show you a while loop. Uh, so remember we have while loops in Ruby. So this is the same kind of thing. So I'm gonna make a variable called up to. It's gonna hold just a number that we wanna count up to. And I'm gonna make a variable called i, which is gonna start with zero. And I'll do while i is less than up to. And I'll do console.log i. And then i plus equals one. So what this is saying is create one variable, which holds 10, which is the number that I want to count up to. Create another variable, which holds, we're going to call i, which holds zero. And then while i is less than 10, output, and then add one. So this is the same as in Ruby, if we were to write up to equals 10, i equals zero, while i is less than up to, and puts i, i plus equals one. This is the Ruby code. This is the JavaScript code. They do the same thing. So they're, if you understand how while loops work in Ruby, now you understand how they work in JavaScript. The only difference is the little parentheses and the curly braces. Uh, yes, we are the next two days pretty much is gonna revolve around using JavaScript in combination with Rails. So, um, we'll spend a little bit of our remaining time talking about more Rails things. Uh, but for the most part, we're going to be talking about Rails plus JavaScript plus CSS. Okay, so I'm going to erase the Ruby, uh, but kind of know, know that it was there. And now if I refresh this again, we're going to see, hopefully it do something. I'm going to see it output the number zero through nine. Uh, Johnny asks, why do we use JavaScript and Rails? Well, the reason is because a lot of times we need to interact with something that the user does. So for example, if we wanted to be able to have on one of, if we wanted to be able to have a refresh button here at the top, there's a couple of ways we can implement that. We can make it so when you click refresh, it just reloads the page. That's how we would do it in just Rails by itself. But on the web, a lot of times we don't want to reload the whole page. Maybe we just want to get the most recent chats. Um, another thing is, okay, a lot of websites that you go to that have chats, you don't need to refresh the page to see all the new chats because they're live chats. Uh, with live chats, we need to be able to get new messages onto the page without reloading the page. And remember, anything that happens that needs 
something to happen without reloading the page needs JavaScript to work because JavaScript is again, the only language that can run in the browser. So if you want some kind of interactive behavior that happens when the user does something in the browser without refreshing the entire page, like a live chat, or like you wanna be able to post a comment and have it just appear in this box, all of that has to be JavaScript because JavaScript is the only thing that runs in the browser. Does that make sense, Johnny? Cool. Um, so Manon, I'm glad to hear you got it figured out. Uh, Louis says, why does it look crossed? Um, that's just my editor trying to tell me not to write the word name. I don't know, I have no idea why. Anonymous attendee says, JS greater than Ruby. Uh, disagree. Uh, anonymous attendee says, how do we comment uh, out a block of JavaScript code in Rails? Uh, how do we comment out code in the HTML ERB files? Uh, I'm not going to show the HTML ERB. Actually, I'll just show it all. So um, a comment in an HTML ERB file looks like this. So it's just less than percent hash mark. And then to show you how to comment in JavaScript, I can also do, which is go in here. And instead of a hash mark at the beginning, it's just two slashes. Yeah, uh, control slash, like someone mentions is, uh, Manon says is very quick way to select some stuff and just quickly do the right thing for whatever language you're working in. Okay, so I showed you alerts, showed you while loops, I showed you console.log. Uh, now we are going to spend some time uh, working with the actual page. Okay, so what we're gonna do is imagine when the page loads that we want to be able to find the first H2 on the page. So we're gonna find this H2. So this is where things become really magical with JavaScript is because we can actually write code document.query selector H2. So now what we write inside of here is the same type of thing that we would write in the CSS. We write H2. And we can actually assign this to a variable. So we can say h2 equals document.querySelector h2. And if I do console.log h2 and I refresh the page, gotta see what happens here. Oh, it breaks. It's not gonna do the right thing. Um, uh, I have to I have to show you one more thing. Okay, I didn't I didn't include this in my my list, so I, I feel like I have failed you by going a little bit out of order here. But um, the problem is that when the JavaScript runs, it's the first thing to run on the page. So you can imagine it runs up here in the nothing space before the page even loads. So the reason it's outputting null is because it's trying to find the first H2, but at the point where the JavaScript runs there are no H2s, because remember the JavaScript is run here at the top, okay? So we need some way to tell JavaScript to wait until the page is loaded. And the way that we're gonna do that is we're going to add a document.add event listener, turbo links load. Now, this is when you're gonna be really happy that you're writing Ruby instead of JavaScript because you're probably looking at this and you're thinking, what even is that? And in order to show you what it is, I'm gonna write it a little bit differently. Actually, I'm gonna start, um, yeah, let me, let me show you one more, let me, I'm gonna, sorry. Let me show you one more thing. The first thing I wanna show you is I wanna show you how functions work in JavaScript. So I'm gonna go back uh, to where we were before. Um, we were at this while, yeah, JavaScript. It's complicated too. Um, JavaScript has a lot of kind of prickly edges and it's hard to uh, basically say anything about it without running into those edges. So the way that, um, the way that it works in JavaScript, if you wanna create a function, let's say you wanna say, say hello to, and remember, or sorry, note that in JavaScript, instead of using underscores, we're using uh, these camel case. That's just how you do in JavaScript. You start with a lowercase letter, and then you um, 
camel case, every other one. It's just the convention in this language. So if you wanted to say hello to John, the way you define a function is like this. You do function, uh, say hello to, um, and then it takes in a name. And you can do console.log name. Okay. So this is the equivalent in Ruby of writing def say hello to name. Hopefully you're seeing that there's a lot of similarities here uh, as far as like the outline of things. And this is say hello to name. Okay. So the only differences are that in Ruby, it is camel case. And the second difference is that we have to write the word function instead of def. Okay. So now we know what a function is. Okay. So now that we know what a function is, we can go back to that previous problem that we had. We wanted to be able to write document.query selector h2. And we wanted to be able to get the first h2 on the page. So if I do console.log h2, now when we refreshed, it wasn't working. And I was explaining that the reason it's not working and the reason it's returning null is because you can imagine up here in the hidden space above the page, that's where the JavaScript is running. So at that point where it's running, the H2 on the page does not exist yet. So we need a way of delaying our JavaScript from running until it's ready. So what we'll do is we'll actually take the behavior that we want and we'll wrap it in a function. And we'll call that function maybe when ready. And it'll be a function that takes no parameters and just does the thing that we want. Okay. And then we have to pass that to something that will say to run that function when ready. So in this case, we have to pass it to a thing called document dot add event listener turbo links load when ready. Okay, so check out what's happening here. This is a method call to document dot add event listener. The first thing is the thing that it's listening for. So in this case, it's listening for an event called turbo links load, which is the thing that happens when Oh, sorry. The thing that happens when TurboLinks actually gets loaded. And then the second argument is the name of a function to run when TurboLinks loads. So what this is, what this is saying is when the page is loaded, run the when ready function. So we've created a function and then we have adding a listener to basically say when the page is loaded, run the when ready function. Um, yes, if you if you want to know about const, you can, uh, I, I typed it by mistake, but um, if you're interested, you can do some research on it. Basically, if you know something won't change, you can use const instead of let. I would not concern yourself with it. Okay, so now if I run it, you can see that the H2 is here. Um, is this making sense to people, this part? I've defined a function, and then I've basically said, when the document is ready, call my when ready method. OK. Um, anonymous attendee says, what's TurboLinks? So when I was describing earlier that Rails auto inserts some JavaScript to make it so that the pages load faster, it's just called, it's called TurboLinks. So instead of, instead of reacting to something like, on ready or DOM content loaded or something, you'll have to respond to TurboLinks load instead. Okay. So I've called add event listener and now I've passed it rather than pass it like an argument, I'm passing it an argument that is actually a reference to a function. And hopefully that makes sense. But if not, we, we probably will talk about it again because I realize it's very confusing. So now when I load the page, I can see the H2 come out. And actually, if I hover over the H2, look what happens. My inspector knows that the H2 that's been output here is the same H2 on the page. And the reason for that is that even though it's writing H2 here, what I actually have, the thing I have in JavaScript that's sitting inside of the H2 variable 
is an object, just like in, in Rails, except this object is an object that refers to uh, this particular element in the page. So I'm actually able to grab a piece of the page and hold on to a reference to it. And I can prove to you that that's the case by writing some code. So I'll just do h2.innerText equals John. So let's run it again. Does everyone see what happened? Now, instead of users, it says John. So my JavaScript code is actually able to go execute when the page runs, grab a reference to an individual element and change it. Um, so hopefully anyone that was asking questions earlier about why would you want code to run in the browser? Why can't Rails just do everything? Um, it, you might not see it right now, but hopefully you're starting to see a glimmer of what, um, why you'd want it and what it can do. So JavaScript can move things around on the page. It can fetch data from the server. It can update things without reloading the page. It can load things in the background. It, there's so much that JavaScript can do. Um, and the, the only reason that it, it's so much that JavaScript can do is because, again, it's the only language that runs in the browser. OK, so inner text equals John. Um, another thing that I can do is I can take this and I can actually do h2.style. And now look what comes up here. This is actually all of the CSS styles just written a little bit differently. I can modify the CSS styles from here. Okay, so I can do h2.style.color is white. So now let's refresh again. Okay, so now we can do more things with JavaScript. We can make it so that um, we can make it so that when the page loads, we're able to modify the style attributes, and we can make it so that we're able to modify um, the inner text of the of the object. All right, let's do another one. Instead of the style, we'll do h two dot class list dot add bake. Now, can anyone guess what h two dot class list dot add does? Yep, it adds a class. So in this case, we're going to add a class called big to h2. So now if I go in and refresh the page, you're going to notice that the text changes to John, but it stays black. And the reason for that is because big doesn't mean anything yet. We haven't defined any CSS rule to tell it what big means. So let's go over to our assets style sheets. And let's say when you have a big, that that means that the font size is 200 pixels. Now, if I refresh the browser, we should see it be small and then instantly turn big when the JavaScript loads. So let's check it out. Come on. OK. So pretty neat. We are able to change the style of something from JavaScript. We don't even know JavaScript yet. And we're able to change the style of something. We're able to add a class to it. And we're able to select an element. Now, what's really neat about this is like we don't know JavaScript, but hopefully you're seeing that the things that we're doing in JavaScript, our introduction of JavaScript, is building on top of the things we know, meaning we're using CSS to get some behavior. We're using HTML to get some behavior. It's all like a big ecosystem that kind of works with itself. I'm going to answer a couple of questions, and then um, I'm going to introduce another concept. So Felipe says, uh, how was the decision by the browser makers to include JavaScript in the browser? Was it because it was so popular, or uh, why did Flash die? I think the reason here is because it was included in early browser. Um, that browser was very popular. I think I might be wrong about this, but I think it might have been like Netscape or something. And then um, other browser manufacturers wanted to be able to run the same JavaScript code. So as they came out with new browsers, because they wanted to be able to not have web pages that only worked for their stuff, they made it so that 
um, so that it could run JavaScript as well. So the only reason it happened that it's JavaScript is because the first browser that put code that could run in the browser, which I think was Netscape again, um, chose JavaScript. That's it. That's the only reason. Uh, and actually, at some point, Microsoft tried to make a competitor to JavaScript. I think it was called ActionScript. Um, but the problem with that was that it was a Microsoft technology. So um, other browser manufacturers never added ActionScript. OK, Ernest says, uh, query selector selects the HTML element. Yes, query selector specifically says, what is the first HTML element with this description. And you can put anything in here. So if you wanted to select uh, the first thing on the page that has dot big, or the first thing on the page that's an H1, or the first thing on the page that is in a div with a H2 inside of it, you want to get that H2. You can write any of the things that you could write in CSS. That's how this works. Uh, Anonymous Tendi says, can you show your application.js and hello.js? So this is hello.js. Hopefully you've seen that. And this is application.js. The only modification I've made is the last line here. Ernest says, so the objective of JavaScript is about selecting HTML elements and styling them on the fly. Kind of. That's one of the things it can do. The real objective of JavaScript is being able to interact with the user, which is the next thing that we're going to do. Uh, Isaiah says, is it convention slash common practice to change styles in JavaScript or do developers prefer to do this in style sheets? Uh, Isaiah, this is a oft debated topic, but I think for the most part, the answer is that you should do it in style sheets. And in JavaScript, you should just be controlling the classes. The idea there, the reason you would want to do that is because, okay, in this, in this easy example, big only is one property. It's to change the font size. Uh, imagine I wanted to um, change 10 properties with big. It would be annoying to have to write that all over my code. Every time that I want to add something, I have to add all those style properties. And then every time I want to remove it, I have to remove all those style properties. Um, so instead, we can create a reusable name called big, which we can reference all the style properties by. Then when we change it once, it just changes the thing everywhere. So I hope that answers your question. The answer is um, use CSS as much as possible. Uh, Passan says, how would you use Query Selector if you wanted a specific H2 on a page? So the way that you would do that is you would add a class to the specific H2 that you wanted. And then you would change your Query Selector to be uh, the class name that you selected. And you'd select by that instead. Uh, Felipe says, is JavaScript free? Uh, yeah, JavaScript is an open standard called ECMAScript. And that is uh, what all the browser manufacturers are basing their implementations on. But every browser has its own implementation of JavaScript. They just happen to all work the same way, mostly. Um, OK, and the anonymous attendee says, can you select all query elements with that page? That is exactly what I'm going to do next. Uh, anonymous attendee also says, if there's no element, we need to use an error handler as well. Yeah, if there's no element, what you'll get back is null. And you can just do uh, if h2, just like we do in Ruby, you can say if h2. And then in here, only run your logic if the h2 actually exists. OK, so as I just alluded to and was asked, we're next going to need to say, OK, what if I wanted to do something with all of the H2s on the page? I'm going to remove this big thing for a little bit. I'm going to refresh just to get things back to normal. OK, so like I said, query selector returns the first H2. Imagine we wanted to run something that actually ran on all of the H2s. So first, I'm going to make a slight modification to the code. I'm going to introduce a new method, and I'm going to call it modify h2. And it's going to take an h2 in. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this code here that I've written about the h2, and I'm just going to move it into modify h2. And then when I call uh, now in, in when ready, I still want to do the thing that I wanted to do the whole time. So I will just call modify h2 and pass it the h2 that I just, uh, that I just got. So functionally, hopefully at, at this point, everyone gets this. This is the exact same thing, which is 
instead of calling that logic directly, I'm going to pass the variable to a new method, and then that method will make the modification. So if I refresh the page, it should work exactly the same. It just gets the first H2 and it changes it to say John. And that's exactly what we're seeing. It does the exact same thing that it did before. So imagine I wanted to do that to all of the H2s on the page. How would I do that with query selector? I wouldn't is the answer. And instead what I would need to use is a query selector document that query selector all. This one you pass H2 to, and when you pass H2, what actually comes back is something that is like an array. So we can put this into here. We can call, con or sorry, let H2s. Okay. And then because it's like an array, we need to go over it. We could do that with a while loop. Uh, and that's what I'm going to do right now. So remember, we're going to start at zero. And we're going to do while i is less than h2s dot length. And we'll call modify h2 of h2s. Um, you can imagine there's a kind of a variable inside of here called like this h2, which is h2s of i, just like in Ruby. And we'll pass this h2 to that. So let's refresh the browser and I'll show that code again in just a second. Oh, I created a bug. We created a problem. Ah, we didn't increment. Okay, run that again. So notice that this time when it when I've um, entered this infinite loop by not incrementing, it's not my uh, it's not my code space that freezes. It's actually my browser that freezes because the browser is the thing where the code is running. Let's open up a new tab and run it in there. Okay, so now look what happened. All my H2s turned to John. So now that we've done that, I want to just go back and I want to recap this code because I think it I may have. Uh, gone too fast there. So when I get query selector all, it's getting essentially an array back. So this is the equivalent of writing h2s equals something like query selector all h2. And that's going to give me back some kind of an array that has element element inside of it, multiple elements. And I'm going to create a variable which holds i equals 0. Then I'm going to go from zero up until the biggest one that I have. I'm going to put the h2 that I'm currently talking about into a variable. And then I will call modify h2 with that variable before I increment i to the next number so that I can go through all of the, the entries. Does this make sense, what I'm doing here, how I'm calling query selector all? And because I have an array, I can go through all of them like this. OK, and for anyone familiar with JavaScript, you might know that there is an easier way to write this. And it's very similar to this line 18. Um, yeah, someone's asking even, they're saying, hey, does like JavaScript have something like do dot each? Yeah, it does. And it's h2s dot for each. And for each takes a method name that it should call for each of the items. So this is saying, go through the h2s. And for each one, call the modify h2 method. So let's run it. And you see it still works. OK. And then when you're reading that, you might be thinking, well, I'm just putting it into this h2 so that I can call for each on it. So you can actually shorten the whole thing by getting rid of the temporary variable and just calling for each directly on there. And that's how you get to this code, which is document career selector all h2 for each modify h2. So what this says is find all of the h2s and then for each one call the modify h2 method. Let's just so we refresh and it does the same thing. Just modify all my headers to John.
Okay, so that's query selector, query selector all. We've learned methods, we've learned conditionals. And you're probably sitting there uh, at your computer and you're thinking, why? Andre, we, we we're gonna cover that. Um, we're gonna cover that in two days or possibly, possibly tomorrow, depending on how many questions I get after the class. Um, so you might be looking at this and wondering like, why, why would we want to do this? Like, great. You modified something on the, on the HTML that you also own. So like you could have just gone into the server and changed it. You could have just written John instead of all the things you wrote in the H2s. That's definitely true. So let's do something with JavaScript that you couldn't do on the server. Okay. So what we're going to do is I'm going to write a document dot add event listener. And the first argument I'm going to write click. And then in the second argument, I'm going to write make background green. Okay. And then I'm going to, because now this is an event listener that much like this one that says, tell me when the page loads, this one is saying, tell me anything that gets clicked. Okay. So now we have to implement that function, make background green, that will take in an element, the element that got clicked. And we can do element.style.background color is green. And let's refresh the page. And if I click some stuff, oh, it's not working. Cannot set property background color of undefined. This is, uh, it's gonna get a little tricky. Uh, okay, so the thing that actually shows up here, I, I made a slight error. The thing that actually shows up here is the event. Um, so I want you to think of this as like the click event. This is the thing that actually gets clicked. So you have your click event. In order to make the jump from the click event to the thing that got clicked, we have to do target equals click event dot target. Okay. And then uh, we can actually call it, let's just call target element. So hopefully that makes sense. The, the thing that actually gets passed into this function that you've passed as your second argument to click is not the element, it's the actual click event, the thing that actually happens, which includes other information like where on the page got clicked. Um, but the most important thing I think that it contains is the target, which is the thing that actually got clicked. And then I will use the target uh, property to get back the element in question. And then I will modify that element using color. So let's refresh again. And let's start clicking stuff on the page. <laughs> so if you just start clicking stuff on the page, you'll see that as you click it, uh, things are going to start turning green. <laughs> uh, it's a little ridiculous. OK. Uh, so hopefully this this shows you that um, this is something that you actually can't do with Rails. You can't uh, you can't click something and have it instantly change color on the page. Um, and a lot of websites do just that. Like for example, this page, this is all JavaScript. I'm moving stuff around. Um, HTML by itself can't do that. So JavaScript is the thing that lets you have users interact with the page without the page reloading. It's a necessary part of the modern web. Um, and we are basically starting our journey into it with just the ability to click something and respond to it. Um, Rajesh, we're going to, um, that's the reason we're learning JavaScript is because we're going to connect it into all of the Rails stuff that we've done so far. Um, today's lesson is just an introduction to JavaScript. The whole point is just to make it so that you all know what JavaScript is, what it looks like, and what it is capable of doing. And then we're gonna, we're gonna work on connecting it back. Okay. Now, one thing that's kind of weird about this page is that I don't actually want every element to be clickable. 
uh, I only want the H2s to be clickable, but you see, I can click anything. I can even click the background, the whole page turns. Uh, I could even click, when I click into these inputs down here, it even works on them. So how could I make it so that it only works on H2s? I can just add a conditional in here and I can say if element dot tag name is H2, uh, this might have to have a capital. Uh, might be lowercase. Okay. So if I say if element tag name is H2, then change the color. Otherwise, don't do anything. So let's refresh it. Uh, right. It needs to be a capital, I believe. So now if I click the H2s, you'll see that they turn green, which is what I expect. Um, all the property, all the tag names are going to be capital. So remember, even if you use lowercase h2, it's always capital in JavaScript. So now as I click on these things, now when I click on these divs or I click on the background, they don't change color. And the reason is because they are not h2s. So even with just like the small amount of JavaScript that we learned where like there's conditionals and there's the access to style and add class, we're able to do so much. We're able to make it so that when you click something, we can react to it. That's really the core of like all JavaScript interactions. We need to be able to click something and have the page do something in return. Um, so it's important for us to learn this so that we in future lessons in the next two lessons can integrate that with our Rails application. Uh, we'll make it so that when you click something, for example, it can go make a call to the server, get the results back and deal with it. Uh, Joe says, can you put a timer on the event? Uh, I'll, I mean, I'll do it just because I think it's interesting, but uh, imagine if we, when we set the background color, you want to click something and then have it wait two seconds. You can actually, um, let's make a new color, that, or sorry, a new function that is called actually set background to green. And then it will take in an element and it will handle just the actual setting to green. So I'm gonna put that inside of there. And then instead of this line, I will call actually set background to green and I will pass the element. Uh, what I can do inside of here now is I can, uh, the way you would do it is with a call to set timeout. Actually, I'll, I'm not going to go into this because if I go into this, I'm going to have to teach you uh, closures. And I don't. I think that's just going to throw people off. So I'm going to skip it for today, Joe. Uh, Joe but if you're interested, look up the documentation of set timeout. Um, but I, I was purposely trying to not show them today, so I'm not going to. Uh, Rajesh says, "No, my question was: we were clicking on anything and it turned green. So in this case, buttons links wouldn't work as expected." Uh, like adding a user or comment, which is weird. No, they still will. So uh, that's a good point to make and a good thing to clarify. So let's say I remove or comment out the part where I was making only the green work for H2s. Um, very important point that Rajesh I either intentionally or unintentionally is making, which is that if I click into these, they turn green. I type something in here, if I click create comment, it's gonna turn green. But look, it still submits. So it's gonna take a second, but it still submits the page even though I clicked. So turning it green does not stop the button from working. There are ways you can stop the button from working, but by default, they uh, it doesn't. So you make a click handler, um, which is what this is called. When you, when you define some behavior for click, it's still gonna do the thing it always does. So if it's a submit button, it'll still submit. If it's a link, it's still gonna follow the link. Um, it will do your thing and then it will go do the thing that it wants to do anyway. Anonymous attendee says, was wondering why to make background green doesn't take any arguments, but still works. Um, it has to take an argument. Oh, sorry, are you talking about down here? If you're talking about down here, then the thing we're actually passing here is not, um, is not it, it is actually a reference to the function. So we'll cover this in more depth tomorrow when we talk about closures. But for now, what I want you to think is add event listener 
passes um, the add event listener takes the name of a function. And then what it does inside of itself for click is it calls that function and it passes it an argument, which is the click event. Okay, so click add event listeners. All it does is it says, okay, what's the function I'm supposed to call? And then it calls it and it passes a click event. Does, does that make sense, uh, anonymous attendee? I guess you can't say yes back, but um, so, so that's what's happening. What's happening is that uh, when you call add event listener click, the function that you call second is supposed to receive one argument, which is the click event. And you can actually look up the documentation. So if you just type add event listener click at MDN, and you click into that. Um, uh, it's, it's hard to see in this documentation right here, but basically it takes the type of the thing and then it takes in a, a method and that method is supposed to take whatever number of arguments are appropriate for that, uh, for that type of thing. So for click, it takes one argument back, which is the click event. Uh, we'll, we'll spend a little bit more time talking about that. So Erica says, is this also possible in Ruby, theoretically speaking? Um, theoretically speaking, yes, although there are limitations to it. And the answer to do closures exist in Ruby is kind of, but not really. But if you want something close, Ruby has blocks. And that's, um, that's how it's possible. We didn't see it, but in Ruby, you can actually pass. Um, uh, if you implement a method that takes a block, that is that works very similar to a closure, except it um, there, there are important differences to that, which are definitely beyond the scope of this class. So I'm not going to, to go into them. Okay, uh, Andre says, does this JavaScript code load for every page? Yes, it does. Um, and it says, can we uh, exclude some pages from loading the code? Um, we probably will cover that, uh, but if we don't, then the answer is, um, that you want to use classes similar to how we use classes for um, for CSS, where you basically say, uh, when the page loads, if this class is defined, then do this behavior. And if it's not, then don't do it. Um, so that's how you'll have to limit your JavaScript. There are other ways, but that's, that's the default way you're going to do it. OK, head on to the homework. So today's homework is this. Um, exercise one is I want you to implement a new route in the home controller with a basic HTML view. I want you to add a series of divs to the page and I want those divs to have red backgrounds. So you can space them out a little bit and do whatever you want to do with CSS. Exercise two, I want you to change the boxes to blue on page load. So when the page loads, JavaScript switches all the boxes to blue. Uh, a tip here is to use query selector all and either a loop or for each. And then exercise three, I want you to add JavaScript so that when those boxes get clicked, the color of each of them changes to pink. Um, so this should be pretty easy. The only reason it's so uh, relatively easy is because um, I know that there are a lot of people in the class that have a basis in JavaScript already, but there are also some people that don't. And for those people that don't, uh, this is a lot because we just introduced essentially an entirely different programming language that works similar, but slightly different. And those people are gonna to need, to, um, need to step through the differences and figure it out. Yeah, so if you're, if you're mostly new to JavaScript or you're new to JavaScript, hopefully this introduction has given you a fairly solid foundation into uh, variables, loops, and functions. Um, there, there's obviously more to JavaScript than this, but we will be going just nowhere near as deep on JavaScript as we went on Ruby. Um, I'm, my goal with JavaScript is to show you what it can do in the browser and how it interacts with Ruby. Uh, we went much, much further with Ruby. Um, and I mean, part of the reason realistically is like I've been saying the entire course, like JavaScript has some very weird and confusing parts. Um, and hopefully, if you don't already dis already dislike JavaScript, uh, <laughs> you will. You will by the end of the course. Uh, Ernest says, can you avoid writing JavaScript in Ruby? Uh, hmm. It, what you're really asking is, can you avoid writing JavaScript when you're using Rails? 
And I think the answer is yes, but it's going to limit what kind of website you can make. So if your website has uh, rich user interactions, like you want to be able to drag one thing between two different areas, it's a little bit harder. You can't really do that with Ruby. You can't do it with Rails. Um, there are a lot of projects out in the world uh, that are being worked on that aim to make it so that you can write Ruby and get rich client-side behavior in JavaScript. So essentially you would write Ruby and then the Ruby would get, um, would get turned into the appropriate JavaScript so you wouldn't have to write JavaScript. Um, if you're interested in that, you can search around for them. I know that there's a lot of active projects that are aiming to do that, but there are none that are mature enough that people are actually using them. So on real websites like GitHub or any of the sites that I've, I've talked about, uh, there is there's JavaScript running on the, uh, on the client side. Yeah, you should check out Hotwire too, if you're interested in, in more information. And that's, that's Hotwire, obviously the project, not the, not the company of the exact same name. So just to search, uh, if you want to search in your browser, you can search uh, maybe like Hotwire Rails and you'll find, you'll find the documentation. Okay. Um, Anonymous attendee says, can you not have the actually set background color to green? Yeah, I had that originally. Uh, I was starting to modify it to, uh, to illustrate a point. And then I decided against, uh, against going that far today because I thought it would be too confusing. So um, definitely the way to write the code is just to put the background color directly into here. And tomorrow we're gonna learn uh, how to not have to do that at all. Basically we, we won't have to define a method called make background green as of tomorrow. But it is very important for you to understand that this is what's actually, I'm gonna show you a way to not have to do it. It's very important for you to understand that this is what's actually happening. So that'll make more sense tomorrow. For now, just learn the basics of functions and learn the fact that you can pass a function by name. So in this case, we defined a function and then we pass the function by name. When ready is a function, and then we pass the function by name. Modify h2 function, pass it by name. Okay. For those of you that are new to JavaScript, um, how are you feeling? Is this making sense? Is is the whole like I think the only new new concept that didn't exist in Ruby is the pass a function by name part. So hopefully that's making sense. You're basically saying like take this function and give that entire function a handle to that function to, uh, to this other method. Um, and you gotta believe me when I say this, like we're, we're not learning more JavaScript. Like we're learning closures tomorrow, which will just make the JavaScript a little bit nicer to read, but like, that's it, we're not doing more. And I actually think like for the most part for a very long time, uh, if you even are writing JavaScript professionally, you will not need more. Like you're going to need uh, closures because they're used everywhere, and you'll have you'll need uh, fetch, which we're going to talk about later in the course. But like, we're not. Um, there are there's so much to JavaScript that is insanely confusing, and uh, I don't advise basically anyone spending the time learning it because you're just going to confuse yourself. Uh, anonymous Tony says one question, H2 at line 15 would work or H2 would work? Uh, only the capital version. So the reason that they do that is because, um, so I didn't cover this. Um, it's actually kind of interesting. If I, um, all of these tags like H2 here can be written either with lowercase or capital. It's just the normal way to write it to use the lowercase. That's just what people do. Um, in early HTML, actually, they use the uppercase. It's just that these days, people tend to write it with the lowercase letters. So we write it like H2. But because you can write it either way, and you could even write like div, like because you can write it either way, um, now, I, now I broke it. Because you can write it either way, the, when JavaScript talks about HTML, it standardizes all of it to the uppercase version so that uh, regardless of how the user wrote it, um, 
you'll find all of them. So it's not case sensitive, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Um, so as long as you're checking the uppercase version, you'll do the right thing. Uh, and that way, if someone wrote H2 lowercase and they were H2 uppercase, you'll actually find all of them by searching by uppercase. Uh, notice that's not the case for here. Um, also, this is, uh, yeah. Does that make sense to, to um, the person that asked that question or because you're anonymous, anyone else in the chat? Uh, Rajesh says, oh, great, Rajesh asked it. So Rajesh says h2 space dot class name. Yeah, if you wanted to, uh, if you wanted to only have like one class name, you could use that up here in query selector. You can't do that down here because this is specifically asking about the tag name. The tag name in an HTML tag is the name like div or h2 or um, m or strong. So if you wanted to reference only the strong tags, you would write strong here. In this case, we're referencing H2 tags, so H2. Uh, someone asks, will I push my code when I'm done? Uh, yes, I would be happy to. Um, and if people have more questions, feel free to keep asking them. Oh God, I'll figure it out. Oh, I'll figure, I'll figure that out. I'll figure that out when we're done. Uh, I'll, I'll push it right after the class though. Okay, any other questions? Okay, anonymous attendee says, I have a question. Are you only gonna consider people who finished the project entirely? Um, I mean, I'll consider you either way. Uh, if you're asking whether or not I will pass your name onto, um, onto companies that are hiring, uh, I would say um, definitely the goal is for you to finish the project. Realistically, like the course, the goal of the course is to push people to a limit and then be able to determine whether or not um, like they've done the work so that I can gain confidence that I can hand you over to an employer um, and that you've at least done the, the set of things that I've, that I've asked you to do in the course, that you've stayed with it, um, because that shows a certain level of dedication and a certain level, level of, um, of, I guess, like promise that you can learn things um, and that you're going you're gonna to be dedicated to learning things. Um, so I do want to make sure that whoever I'm passing along to these uh, employers and whoever I'm including in this and trying to help find a job after the course that are the people that have stayed with the course and that I'm um, doing everything I can to, uh, to elevate those people um, that are staying with the course. I hope that answers your question. There are also a couple of people that I think um, have like messaged me from the beginning of the course and said like, I'm already a developer, but I don't, want to take the course, it's like the course is for teaching people to program. So if the, if the only reason someone's here is to um, get a recommendation for a job, I respect that, but need to like handle it separately from this. This is about teaching people to program and then um, helping them connect to an employer. I hope that answers your question and that that answer is satisfactory. Um, but everyone that is in the course that has been following along or is planning on catching up, know that if you, um, if you finish the course, do all the work, and then finish that final project, I'm gonna do everything I can to, um, to connect you to people that I know that are hiring. Ernest says, considering that most of us are not living in the US, will be considered for jobs? Um, yeah, so there's, a, I can tell you that the list of, the list of companies that have uh, messaged are not US only companies. Most companies that are tech companies these days hire hire globally, at least any, any companies that are big enough to warrant hiring a significant amount of junior engineers are global companies. So should be, should be okay. Um, depending on where you live, there are, there are some countries that 
for some companies are difficult to hire in. Uh, so a lot of times, um, for example, if you're living in, uh, I don't want to single out a country, but if you're living in a country that it has export restrictions to the United States and the, com the company is a United States-based company, um, sometimes they can only hire in certain countries. That is a, that is a problem um, that a lot of people get around by either finding a company that doesn't have those restrictions or isn't based somewhere that those restrictions exist or moving to another country uh, that is nearby the country that they're in. So maybe if you, uh, if you grew up in, um, I don't know, if you grew up in Ukraine and you um, wanna work for a company, but the company you wanna work for is not hiring there, maybe they would ask you to move to uh, Amsterdam or something, somewhere that they can hire. So yeah, Ukraine, I've always wanted to go. Someday. Ernest says, um, even if we're employed, is that going to be remote? Uh, I think it's, you know, for now, probably because it's, uh, you know, coronavirus is still uh, pretty prevalent. But um, I mean, a lot of companies are global in such a way that they have, they have offices um, in multiple places. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, and also just like to really nail home, like I'm not, I can't promise you a job. Um, a lot of boot camps can promise you a job because they essentially just like interview you beforehand. And then like, you're already ready for an interview before you even go through the thing. What I can promise you is that I'm going to do my best to connect you to people that want to talk to you about your programming experience. So uh, I can help you. Uh, I can look at your resume. I can give you tips on things you might want to change. Uh, I can help you uh, connect to some employers, which I'm going to do. Um, and then I guess separate of that, like we're teaching programming here, so, you know, so you're going to have a marketable skill. So even if you don't get hired immediately, you'll have a skill that you can build on and get hired in the future. So I hope that makes it clear that like, I'm just going to do my best. That's, that's all I can do. I'm going to do as much as I possibly can. And I'm going to prioritize, <laughs> this is like the addendum to that. I'm going to prioritize doing my best for the people that have put in the work and finished the projects at the end of the course. Okay, Anonymous Attendee says, um, any suggestions for people who are a bit disadvantaged with no experience in these tech stacks or stuff like that to be able to come up with something near to finishing the project on their own? Uh, I would spend some time going back and going through the lectures again. Um, it is a lot to learn in a short period of time, but realistically, I need to, um, the people that I hand to the companies need to be, um, what, what you get with the boot camp, uh, what employers, and I'm not talking about you now, I'm talking about the employers. What the employers get from taking people from a boot camp is they get the ability to say, okay, is this boot camp? Is the fact that this person went through this boot camp a meaningful signal to me that they know what they're doing? Um, if I send everyone to all of these companies, the problem is that they might um, interview a couple people off the list or talk to a couple people off the list and then decide that um, the bar that we've set with the boot camp is not high enough for them to even talk to people and hire them as junior engineers. And that'd be really unfair to the people that are doing the work and doing the projects and doing the final project and are not, um, are not accepted because they're uh, essentially being um, knocked down a peg by the people that are not doing the work. And that's why it's important that I, um, that I uh, have a final project and that's the bar re remains high. I hope that makes sense. I want, I want, I want to help people, but I need, um, I need you to help me help you. Um, and what that means is that if you don't do the work that I can't in good faith send you to an employer because that would make everyone else in the class um, potentially not look as good. Uh, the count today of attendees was 68, I believe, I, right, right toward the beginning of the course. Uh, Daniel says, do you think there's a way to include the four-week class in our resume? I would be happy if you did. Um, I think that you should. Uh, I think you should say you did it. I will, if anyone emails me or wants to know whether you did and you actually did, then I will tell them very happily that you did. Um, 
Joe says, so much valuable information for actual application. Yeah, there really is. If you didn't, didn't program before, now your CV says that you went through this boot camp, four weeks long, it's intensive, and you can write that the boot camp had HTML, CSS, JavaScript, Rails, um, including some basic introduction to SQL and like how a database works, um, and including like interaction between Rails and the server, which is what we're going to do over the next two days. Um, that's a lot of stuff. If like if you have gone this far and you've gone from nothing to something and you don't write it on your CV, I think you're probably doing yourself a disservice. Um, and I realize it's a lot. I mean, if you haven't written, like there are people in this course and like do a little hand raise emoji or something if this is you, but there are people in this course that went from not writing code to writing a Rails application in Ruby, a language that they'd never seen before. And then writing now JavaScript, that's two programming languages in 16 days. And that's not even including the other two programming languages, which are HTML and CSS. There are people here that have learned four programming languages over the course of four weeks. That's insane. It's like if someone here has even written Java before, and maybe you've written a server-side Java application or you've written a PHP application, you're writing four new programming languages, four of them. And like, it takes a lot of work to do that. You know, like um, we went from a point, it took on my list here, it says that it took us four days to introduce Ruby, to get the basics of Ruby and kind of how it works. So we learned about variables, functions, all that. I just showed you all in the class, you had the same level of knowledge as you did in Ruby that you do in JavaScript. And somehow we did the exact same set of stuff for JavaScript in an hour. You know what that means? That means that you're learning how a programming language works. It's the same way as if you spoke Spanish and I taught you the basics of Italian, you're gonna pick it up pretty quick. It's like, they're very similar languages. Now to learn that long tail of all the rest of the knowledge, that's gonna take some time. But that base, the fact that like, I, we, we did some foundation in Ruby and now I can just like show you this and all, all you really have to do is be like, oh, well, this has curly braces instead of an end. And like, now we're writing JavaScript. We learned how to think about programming languages. So pat yourself on the back if you're, if you're still with us and um, yeah, keep it going. Uh, anonymous attendee says, I missed the answer earlier. How long do we get on the project? Uh, it's gonna be a few weeks. Um, at the end of this week, we're going to do our final course on Thursday, and then I am going to get into an RV and take my family camping <laughs> for a couple of days. I'll still be answering email and, and doing Slack and stuff, but, um, and then there'll be another week after that where I'll, I'll be answering questions, and then um, after that will be the end. So I'm, I'm thinking two to three weeks is reasonable. Uh, I think I covered this before, but if... Um, if the more time that you give someone is not the more time that they work. But typically what happens is actually you give them more time and you give them more time to wait. And the more time that I give you to wait, the more time you're going to uh, not have this material in your head. So I wanna give you the project and I would give you a fairly tight timeline uh, so that things can be done um, in a reasonable time so that we can all do more stuff. Um, and you can all write to me in a year and tell me how like your career is going and you know how things are, are going. Uh, Paul Senior says RailsConf. Yeah, so for anyone that didn't see this in the chat, I'm gonna do my absolute best. I, I think this is what you're asking, but if not, uh, let me know. Um, I dropped in the chat on Thursday that some people have been offering me some money, which is very nice of them. And what I'm trying to do with the money is I'm trying to uh, rather than take it, which I would love to take it, um, I'm gonna not take it and instead I'm gonna try to reflect the money back to you. So what we're gonna do is I, I put an interest list for people that might wanna go to RailsConf. Then I put a, a public kind of call out for people that might have some money and be willing to uh, support people new in their career. I think I have 15 people from this course that have indicated interest in going to RailsConf and I have 11 people out in the world that are willing to purchase a ticket. 
um, I, um, I appreciate everything that everyone's doing. I'm going to try to get you all tickets, but I'm going to have to prioritize the tickets first to the people um, that have stayed up with the course, that are showing interest in Ruby, uh, and hopefully need to prioritize first people that really can't afford the tickets because the ticket is $300. And there are some people that can go if they're interested by paying the $300, even if it's a stretch for them. And there are some people that literally cannot afford that. So I, I'm going to try to prioritize the people that actually can't afford it. Kind of a, the cross, the intersection of people that can't afford it and people that are sticking with me. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, anonymous attendee says, how many people are able to finish everything on time? Uh, I mean, early on, that was a, a lot of people. Now it's probably uh maybe 20 people per class that are finishing before the class starts but then there's like another 50 to 60 people that are finishing things by the next class so that that whole thing i've been saying about being one class behind totally playing out in like the real world uh anonymous attendee says any further plans on you taking another boot camp after this uh we learned a lot from you so we'd want to learn yeah i've i've thought about it i've thought about Another version of this boot camp, and I've also thought about like a follow-on kind of V2 of this boot camp. So like you would be invited back to that uh, TBD on details. But um, there is a form on the internet that I've put out for anyone that's interested in taking this course again. That's either going to be me teaching it again or me giving the syllabus to someone else and having seeing if they can teach it. Uh, but I'm also not ruling out, I guess the, the point of your question, I'm also not ruling out doing uh, an extended version of this course for the people that are interested. Anonymous attendee says, already sad it's coming to an end. Yeah, it, it is. Um, I'm, I'm sad that it's coming to an end too. This, is, uh, this has been pretty amazing. Um, oh, I love that idea, by the way, whoever, Ernest, uh, I'm glad to act as a TA in the next session. That's a fun idea. Um, and I think that I think that'd be great. Um, it is said it's uh, it's been a lot, but obviously I've I've had a great time spending uh, spending the days with you. Anonymous attendee says, "Is there a way for us to donate? I can't sponsor a whole ticket, but I could give a little." I don't. I'm a little. I a couple of people have written with that where they want they could have maybe a hundred dollars that they would like to be able to donate. Um, the problem is that if I take $100 from you, I have to take it personally into, into my bank account. Maybe that's the way to do it. I, that, yes, the answer is yes, you can do it. Uh, so the, the way that, uh, <laughs> if you email me, I'll help give you more details on this. And this is a great answer for other people that have wanted to donate. What I'm gonna do is I'll just take the money into my bank account and I'll just turn around and I'll buy a ticket um, and I'll handle. Um, I didn't wanna do that on a larger scale because there's like tax implications. So the reason that I don't wanna take, um, the reason I don't wanna take all of the money from the people that are willing to buy the tickets and take it to me and then give it to you, to, or sorry, then buy the tickets with it is because it's, it's very difficult to do that um, with taxes and everything. So the better way to do it is this way that I've thought of where basically I can just funnel the money directly from them to you. Then there's no, there's no like, uh, I don't need to have like a nonprofit status or anything to do what I'm trying to do. So, Hopefully that makes sense, everything I just said. Um, so the answer is if your donation amount is $100 or less, then um, uh, email me and I'll find a way that you can just give me the money and then I'll send the money back out. Paul Senior says, thank you. No, thank you. Uh, Rajesh says, sorry being anonymous and asking all these just felt like weird asking in public. That's fine, you can be anonymous. Uh, anonymous attendee says hashtag Bitcoin. Yeah, I love Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin is definitely an option. Um, although that introduces like a whole nother wrinkle of like getting the right amount of money to the right people. Um, but I, I do, I love Bitcoin. So, um, okay, Whew, just talked for a while there, but um, I'm gonna do my best for the people that want to, are able to, and are interested in going to RouseConf to make it so that they can go. Uh, Johnny says the final project will be on a code space or another code editor. Uh, 
<sighs> hmm. You can use anything you want to, to write your code. So if you feel like setting up Rails locally on your machine and you want to do that, please do that. It's totally fine. You can do that throughout the whole course. If you, I just, I just don't want to own the process of um, trying to figure out what's wrong with everyone's computers. What I want to do instead is give you this common environment. So if you prefer to use your own, your own, sorry, local setup, then please do that. Please just um, do that, and that's fine. Um, and I might show you in the final course how to. Uh, how to push your code to Heroku so you can actually put the app out there in the world that other people can see it too. Okay. Uh, Charles, if, if you're interested and please just fill it out and just try to fill it out as honestly as you can. You know, I'm not going, there's, if you fill it out honestly and you're like, I can totally afford the ticket, that doesn't mean I'm not gonna buy you a ticket or that I'm not gonna find a way to connect you with someone that can buy you a ticket. Um, I just want an honest answer so that I can make sure that I'm prioritizing people that can't afford them first. I hope that makes sense to everyone here and it doesn't upset anyone. Um, Jessica says, I'd love to donate, but due to my economical situation at the moment, I could own, I could uh, in a couple months, max when I get a new paying job, but I definitely want to give you back part of my first pay. Uh, would it be possible? Sure, you can just email me and we'll, we'll try to figure it out. And my answer then and now will probably be that I'll try to find a way to take the money that you're willing to give me, and I will try to give it to some organization that benefits underprivileged or sorry, underrepresented or underprivileged people in tech. Um, that's the goal of the course. That's what we're trying to do here. So, um, I I love money. I said this in the in the public post. I love money a lot. Like, I want money. Um, I just don't want. Um, I don't want money for this because the reason that I'm trying to do this is to help you, not to help me. So um, maybe in the future I'll teach a paid boot camp and you can come, uh, you can come join that. But um, I don't want your money for this. If anything, I will ask you to make a donation to an organization that I pick, and I'll be I'll be happy to tell you one if you email me when you get your job. Anonymous attendee says, if we've been using our local for the rails assignment, should we push those? Yeah, if you want feedback from me, you have to push the code to GitHub. I can't see it otherwise. So if you want the feedback, um, just push it up to GitHub and in our organization so I can see it. I do love money. I mean, money's great. So, all right. Uh, tomorrow, we are going to cover uh, a little bit more JavaScript, and we're specifically going to cover JavaScript that can interact with our Rails application. So, oh yeah, that, that's a great program. Uh, people that are interested in, um, in a scholarship to RailsConf, they have a scholarship program. You can apply that way. Unfortunately, their scholarship program only has a limited number of attendees, So, and, and they try to give it to um, to people that need it, just like I'm trying to do. Um, if you maybe applied for the scholarship program, you didn't get it, it's fine. Um, just apply here and I will do my best uh, to connect you with someone that can buy you a ticket. And um, if you filled out my form and you got a ticket, I'm begging you to please email me because I would hate to buy you a ticket, but you already have one. So just email me if that's the case. Uh, RailsConf is in, is virtual. Felipe says, I probably missed some words about RailsConf. Is there a website where we can see what it's about? Um, yeah, so you would check out, uh, just Google RailsConf or, or go to railsconf.com and that'll show you what it is. It's the biggest Rails conference on the planet. It's virtual, this year at least. Normally it's in person. Have you already distributed the tickets? No, I have not. Um, that is still something that I have to do. I was kind of just waiting for all the respondents that I'm going to get, and then I'm going to go, uh, I don't know, drink a glass of wine and figure out um, how to actually do the matching process. Because it's also a bit complicated because I have to, um, I have to have them buy a ticket, and then I have to get the ticket transferred to you. So we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out somehow. 
Uh, Sewell says, I joined session 11 and 12 assignment. Your feedback will be appreciated. Yeah, if, if I haven't given it to you, again, uh, it's very difficult for me to, um, to it, when I open up all your repositories, the system on completes session five, like today, I can't tell whether or not they completed session five just now and they're still with the course just way behind or if they like um, are not, you know, like I don't, I don't know if they're still doing it or not. So what I've been doing is just checking the most recent assignment. So if you have an assignment that you already checked that's older than the most recent assignment, just message me on Slack and I'll do it. All right. I'm gonna see you all tomorrow. Have a good night.